hello, and welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Let's Play series. Usually, I like to include you along with me in the journey of setting this stuff up, but uh, I've had family visiting the last two weeks here, and I could only really record like one hour before my bedtime, and it was like way too late to be talking. <laughs> so I just did all this stuff off camera, and I figured I'd show it to you uh, once I had time to record here, like today. Yep, yep, so last episode we worked on this dragon egg tunnel together, and most of you seem to enjoy the design, which is great. I looked at the, the feedback for that, and I made some changes to it as well, such as uh, getting rid of the dragon head lock system at the end here. Instead, I decided to do what you guys recommended and just hook it up to the fire flippers, so when we throw an ender eye, check this out. Ender eye goes into the wall there. Sometimes it breaks and it doesn't work, but most of the time it, it activates. Aha! <laughs> so it flips to the orange fire when the lock has been uh, deactivated. And you also get the dragon note block sound because I put dragon heads on top of note blocks like you guys recommended. And so we got a five stage lock to the dragon egg room now. What good is a dragon egg tunnel without a dragon egg room, right? So that's what I've been working on over here. And there's a lot of stuff going on with this build, so I'm just going to be quiet when we open the door, and I'll just let you take it all in, okay? All right, one lock left. Isn't that cool? <laughs> oh, I think it's so cool. When we want to leave the room, we hit the button over here. Fire flippers are going. Door is closed. We're free to leave. And then all the fire flippers go back to blue. Aha, uh -huh. yeah, so a lot of stuff going on in that dragon egg room. I thought we would do this again, and this time I'll give you commentary as we go through it. Try to break it down, point out some of the nuances to how this all works. Basically, these fire flippers are hooked up to a hopper clock, each each pair. And when one side of the hopper clock is locked, it'll be blue fire. When the other side gets locked, it gets locked to the orange fire. And then if we unlock both sides, it'll constantly flip between blue and orange and orange and blue. And then we have our piston door that opens up. So there's a mix between sticky pistons opening and then a flying machine as well. And it makes its way across to the other side here. And we got the beacon, which comes online once it makes it to the end. And it just kind of sockets into place at the end there. And then we also have the flying machines that come out of the floor here to create a bridge for us to get across. The idea behind this, besides it just being like super cool, <laughs> is uh, I like the idea of it adding to the effect that the dragon egg is under high security here. Like you can't reach it unless you have security clearance to get to it. And then the bridge comes up for you. Like if you broke through the door, it'd be like, oh, there's, there's no way to get to it still. We're using a trick with these flying machines where they run into a glass pane in each of the corners trying to keep it kind of invisible, right? Where you don't really see it. They're at their pushing limit with the pistons, 12 blocks. And then when it runs into the glass pane, it reaches 13 blocks and the pistons can't push anymore. And that's how we freeze them in place like this. And we can stop them wherever we want in midair. Aha. There's also one other sort of subtle effect happening. We have, um, let's see if we can see it here. There's some lighting behind those shulker boxes there. And every once in a while, it'll kind of flash like that. So. There's, what are they called, soul torches behind the shulker boxes. They have a light level of seven. And then randomly, a glowstone lamp will turn on behind them and it bumps up the lighting to 15. And that's how you get that little flash every once in a while. Uh-huh. And then 
we have our books over here with our special lore information behind the world. This is the one we added last episode. Going through all the details. I guess I'll flip through it real quick in case you didn't see it last time. If you want to pause the video, you can check it out. Found a couple other random books around our world just to fill up the other spots here. I found our to-do list. Threw that in here. Some of those actually got done, believe it or not. Some of them will never be done. I found the old Nexus uh, book I used for organizing how everything was going to get placed in there. And I also found our book from the World Tour 550. So when you downloaded my world, this started in your inventory. You see we got the flower up there creating particle effects as well, along with the new pink, uh, pink petals. I was trying to use some of the new blocks that came out, like the bamboo and stuff, and I, I thought it kind of worked out okay here. Uh, there's hidden lighting all over in the wall as well, just to make it a little bit brighter in here. It's kind of a dark room because I want your main focus to be on the dragon egg at the end of it, not really on the room itself. Uh, and then when we hit the button here, I'll just kind of show you what happens if we stay inside. So first off, it triggers the flying machine. It disables the beacon. That returns. And if you look in the ceiling, you might catch a glimpse here. Oh, you see that? It drops some seeds down. And what happened is there's some string in midair next to the flying machines. And when that string gets triggered by the seeds falling from the ceiling, it tells those flying machines to go back down into the ground and reset. Aha! And then this one makes its way over here. The door closes. The record goes into position out of the jukebox and ready for the next time you open the door. So it all totally resets. This flying machine runs into these trap doors. So it hits the piston limit as well, and that's how we freeze it in place here. Yeah, so there's a piece of string next to these observers, and when an item falls through that, it tells it to go down. Now, there's a pretty insane amount of redstone to this whole system. A little too much for us to cover, but I'll show you a little bit behind the scenes here, behind the walls, what's going on. Uh, so we got our fire flippers running down the tunnel there, and below each pair of those is a hopper clock. Uh, which controls whether it's blue or orange flame. If this side is powered by the repeater, it's a blue flame. And if that side's powered, it gets locked to the orange. If this piston retracts, then it unlocks the hopper clock and it can flip between orange and blue. Probably the thing you're going to be most interested back here, though, is the ender eye locking system, because that's a bit of an unusual thing you don't see too often. The way I did that is I figured out through trial and error roughly where the thrown ender eyes turn back to items and I set up these water catch basins for each of the five locks and these can be as big as you want or as small as you want the bigger they are the more inaccurate you can be with your throws so mine's four by five here which gives me a couple blocks of leeway when I throw the ender eye it doesn't have to be perfect and basically the thrown ender eye turns back to an item falls in the catch basins they are collected into the corner here, into a hopper. That hopper has a comparator attached when it gets powered from the ender eye. It tells this redstone block to move forward from the piston. We also collect the ender eyes together here, so if I ever want to reclaim them, they don't get destroyed. I can get them back because <laughs> I'm cheap. Aha! Uh -huh. These redstone blocks also act as a memory units to keep track of which ones have been triggered and save it. Now that all five have been triggered, this redstone line unlocks totally and sends a pulse over to our door and to our jukebox. Uh, these redstone blocks also run down to those hopper clocks we just saw and block or switch the blue fire to the orange whenever it flips to the right here. Uh-huh. But if we follow this line down to the door and to the jukebox, basically we keep the record, the pig step in this dropper. When it receives the pulse, it shoots up to the hopper, feeds it into the jukebox, and plays it automatically using the new feature that came out. When the record's done playing, it'll automatically get collected in this hopper and go back to the dropper, and it completes the cycle, uh, the loop there. The piston door is up above here. It's kind of blocked off. We can't really see it anymore, but this is kind of one half of it. The other side's pretty similar to it. Uh, if we go down below, we go to the flying machines at the bottom of the room. And the room is a lot bigger than it might seem. Just because it's so dark, you don't really notice just how big it is. But uh, it took a while to dig out. 
Uh, we got a hopper clock here. Just add a little bit of delay to it so it doesn't happen right when we open the door. We we kind of wait for the drop of the music just to create some, that build up, that dramatic effect when it happens. And then we send a redstone signal to all four of the flying machines in the ground. The observer is next to the note blocks here, so when it gets powered, they take off and they're just socketed into the ground. And we have to be extremely careful with this build here that we don't have creepers spawning anywhere, because let me tell you, that happened a few times. <laughs> so I have ender chests and hidden lighting in a few places just to keep them from spawning. Like, like when the flying machine's up there, we don't want them spawning down in the socketed area. We need to light stuff up everywhere. Uh, otherwise, we might blow up our dragon egg, and that would be a, a disaster, let me tell you, because I only got the one. Uh, if we go up the staircase here, it goes to the other end of the room, up to the beacon. So this is a three by three beacon. When the piston retracts the iron block here, the beacon's disabled. When it extends it out there, then it turns on. Uh, this goes up also to our flashing light thing we saw, which I'll explain in just a second. It's kind of a weird thing you might never have seen before. But yeah, it's a fire randomizer, basically. There's two of them. That was one of them. The other one's on this side over here. This also goes up to the system for sending the flying machines back down. Again, with a bit of a delay. Just so the timing is right, we have time to get back to the other side of the room before they go down. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll get stuck with the dragon egg when we hit the button. Uh, but yeah, what this does... It's a little bit of a pain if you've ever tried to work with tripwire. It does not detect when items pass through it. No, tripwire only detects when items are in it. So if an item is falling very quickly, it might pass through the tripwire without actually ever touching it. Yeah, so we built a system here to account for the randomness of the droppers because they don't drop items straight down. They have a random height to them when they come out of these as well as a random horizontal momentum. And if the height is incorrect, it might pass straight through the, the tripwire. If the horizontal momentum is high, it might not fall straight down. It might have a bit of a, a distance to it, you know, and it might totally miss the tripwire. So we got to lock that all into place. And we do that by shooting it out of the dropper. We wait a second for it to land on the block and lose all its momentum. That way the height is always exactly the same when we drop it as well. And that guarantees when this piston retracts and drops the item, it will always make the flying machines retract into the ground after and not miss the tripwire. And then it goes off to our piston door at the very end here to close it. So to do this project, we actually had to go out into the nether to find a brand new bastion that had the pick step record in because all my bastions have been generated before brutes got out of the game and, and the record. So this was my first encounter with a brute and let me tell you, it was a fight for survival. <laughs> I was trying to keep them all alive because they don't respawn, but this guy, he pushed me too far, I tell you. Oh, man. I'm so upset right now. My internet in, in the entire neighborhood has gone down for hours. What, what am I supposed to do with my life? I don't want to go outside. It's too hot out. There's mosquitoes. And I gotta get this episode done. I got so many first world problems. If only I could make a TikTok right now, I'd be so popular. I wanted to show you the fire randomizer because it's actually a pretty cool trick if you ever need like a flickering light effect this works pretty perfect for it or just any short term high frequency random pulses this is the thing for you because uh, for whatever reason the fire is a little bit special it puts out a lot of block updates very quickly for about a minute after it's lit and then it just dies out and you don't get any more. So it kind of shuts itself off. So you can see the fire's kind of gone stale here. It's been sitting out for over a minute and now it's no longer sending out any more random pulses. So if we want it to go again, we can't just like attempt to relight it or give it a block update. That doesn't do the trick. You pretty much just have to put it out and relight it totally here. So piston works good for breaking the fire or water. And then when we light it again, it'll start pulsing once again, right? Prove me right. There we go. <laughs> One thing that's always kind of bothered me is this pyramid doesn't really do anything. It's just that giant empty shell hiding the mob system inside of it, which I like, don't get me wrong. I think it looks better than having a giant cube of hardened clay just sticking out of the ground. <laughs>
<laughs> but it's a bit of a letdown to have such a massive structure that serves no real purpose. The other thing that's kind of bothering me is I'm getting a little too lazy. It, it's been enough time here. I am so sick of manually farming wool and stuff. And that's one of the main reasons I don't build with wool or use banners all that much. It's because this is our only sheep farm <laughs> in the game. And I think it's time we upgrade to the automatic version. Uh-huh, yeah, so the timeline on this is a little confusing, but I actually did this project back when my family was visiting, so I'm just going to give you commentary on the building montage here. We gathered up some bamboo with the bamboozler because we got to build with the new blocks. New blocks are best blocks, after all. Brought the sheep over to the, the sheep farm, and yeah, you're a little bit hasty there. It's all good. We got more. And then, after eradicating the cats and the dogs that were living inside the pyramid, we got rid of the vegetation as well. And oh, oh it's so satisfying. Listen. Oh, yes. Leveled it off, and then we're ready to start building. So I started putting together some patterns here. I like the new bamboo, especially the green colored one. I think it looks pretty cool. Uh, it just so happens that the sheep farm fits pretty perfectly on this bottom layer of the pyramid. Like, it's just the right height to fit under that uh, staircase gap. Um, so that was, that was great. Added some details, you know, another layer on the on the pyramid so we could separate the floor and then we start putting the grass down for the sheep and this is the pattern we went for of course you detect when the sheep eats the grass and then the dispenser shears them and the sheep even went in for me look at that amazing and then uh we got 16 sheep in there one for each color action shot look at that oh and then the travesty happened i ran out of ender pearls here so I tried to jump that gap and failed miserably, and then I flew back up, and oh, it just it hurts to watch this. No, oh. oh, it gets worse. It gets so much worse. So I went back to recover my stuff, and sure enough, a skeleton saw me. Oh dear, what do you do now, right? What do you do? Oh. No. <laughs> yep, yep. So I ended up actually just loading it back up after this happened because the damage was so great. I, I lost like an hour of building on the automatic sheep farms, but it's all good. So let's go check out inside the pyramid. Let's see how it's changed, what it's looking like now, and what we got left to do. As you can see, the top portion here still has a little bit of empty space, not a whole lot. Uh, we filled up the bottom here, which was the biggest chunk of it, and we'll just have to figure out something to put up here. I'm not going to try to force it today. I'll wait till I have a, an idea with it. I kind of hesitate. It's hard to know what to do. Like, if I put a floor at this level, and, like, one at this level, there's really not a lot of height left to add any detail. <laughs> and there's not a lot of width here to really do anything, so maybe I just... I don't know. Maybe I just make it one floor, and close that top part off, and make it, like, from this level to up here, and put something in here. Either way, I'll figure something out. The mob system takes up a pretty good chunk of this, though. But in the basement is where the sheep farm is, and it fits so perfect down here. Oh, look at this place. So cool, right? Right? It's a little awkward. Again, we got the mob farm we're working around in here. <laughs> Tried to blend it in as well as I could. Went for a nature-themed to kind of match the, the reddish-brown color here with the packed mud. I feel it goes pretty good with that. Um, our sheep are all on the outside. We got one of each color. They each got their pens, and again, like, they had just the right amount of space where I didn't have to cram them together to get them to fit. They fit pretty good in here. Uh, they each have their own double chest where their wool gets uh, automatically sorted. We are in a desert, right? So I don't really like how grass and ferns and that look in the desert, so I didn't really spam the ground with that kind of stuff. Instead, we used azalea leaves and birch leaves that don't keep the biome color and then i use like saplings and and flowers and stuff to kind of fill up some some of the decoration um and i think that worked out pretty good yeah so let me run you through some of the technical details of our sheep farm here so as you can see the sheep stand on top of a dirt block every once in a while a hopper minecart comes by to pick up the wolves that uh, get sheared off from the dispenser we have an observer detecting when they eat the grass, and then it sends a pulse to the dispenser. We also have an end rod here to light up the, the dirt so that grass can grow to it. And we try to surround the, the dirt block with as much grass as possible. Because the more you have within the range, the faster it regrows and the more wool you get. So there's seven at the bottom level here. 
six at this level, and then nine up at top here, all within range of spreading their grass to that dirt block. If we go behind the scenes, we can check things out a little better. So the hopper minecart comes down, it's just going in a loop all around the pyramid, and then it goes over here. This is the block the sheep is standing on, and it picks up any wool when it goes underneath here. And when the minecart comes by, it activates this detector rail, which causes the junction to switch. So it'll go into here, and then after a second, it'll go out. It went in, and then it went out. The only thing about that, though, is for two of the directions, this junction isn't going to be facing the right direction. So in that case, we use a redstone torch hooked up to the detector rail, put it three blocks back, and then... Uh, it will go the correct direction again. Aha. Uh -huh. You'll notice we have hoppers underneath these tracks. I use, I think, five of them. So that when it picks up the wool here, it drops off the wool in these hoppers. And even if the sheep get sheared twice by the time the minecart gets here, uh, it will be able to drop off all that, all that wool before it gets to the next color. And that's how we avoid using any kind of item filter to get the, the wool in the correct places. Uh, and then this just leads to the double chest going this way. It's like underneath here somewhere. Uh, anyways, the other thing we had to do with this is put up some Enderman protection. <laughs> so all my things, I got sandstone surrounding them so that Enderman can't walk up to the grass blocks here and steal them. Because there's no way I'm going to spend a lifetime repairing that. We also put blocks above the rails because if a mob was to ever get knocked onto here, um, they could stop the minecart and then we stop getting wool. One more thing we're going to do with this is we're going to add a name tag to each of the sheep here. So Magenta Sheep gets the name Magenta. You're purple. We don't talk to you anymore. And I believe by doing this, we remove them from the passive mob cap. And if we can get rid of all the passive mobs in our spawn chunks, either by name tagging them or by, I don't know, killing them <laughs> is an option as well. Uh, and then remove the grass in our spawn chunks, we will actually get passive mob spawning to work in our world, which would be great because otherwise I gotta always go to brand new chunks to generate new mobs, and it's a bit of a problem in the world, uh, especially when new content comes out. I spelt gray wrong, I know, I, I do that all the time. It's with an A apparently. Oh, I'm just gonna roll with it. It doesn't really matter. Please don't laugh at me. I think I spelled Grum wrong as well. <laughs> we'll find out. I think it's two M's. Um, okay, Jeb. Oh, it's with an underscore, isn't it? Oh, I totally... Oh, it's fine. It'll work. There has been a mystery looming over this world for years now. And just like me, you all have been wondering, Etho, why on earth... Is there so many missing comment of the days, especially from like episode 300 to 400? Those chests don't look full to me. There should be at least 10 in each of these. And th there's like so many missing. You know, there's what, six in there? Seven? Why isn't there 10? This one's only got two in. Where did they go? You know, it's been bugging me forever here. How could I have lost so many books in my world? Where? Did I leave them, you know, because I usually put them in these chests here and every once in a while I'll haul them over to the library. That's my go-to method. Well, it turns out they didn't get very far because there's a secret spot under these stairs and I forgot like back when I built these stairs. I didn't remove these chests that were here and these are the comments of the days, the missing ones that I couldn't find forever. Just sitting right here. All the way back to the episode like 300. Speaking of llamas, what's the comment of the day say today? Let's go find out, shall we? What you got for us? It says, only Etho invents a brand new redstone device and mentions it almost in passing. Two, actually, it's a little difficult to follow the redstone that quickly. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> So this brings up a couple points I wanted to mention. First off, why I don't claim credit for any of my inventions anymore? Well, good reason for it, actually. I don't know what the millions of other Minecraft players are doing out there. It could be you, even. Maybe you did the exact same thing I thought I invented, right? 
and maybe you even did it better than me. And here I'm going on, oh, look at what I did. I'm so great. I'm so amazing. I don't have an ego. And uh, <laughs> it turns out, oh, look, this other person did it. And now I'm stealing credit from you. So it's a, a bit of a dangerous road to go down. Uh, a little bit of an egotistical thing to do as well. And it's just better not to do it. I've actually been burnt in the past on this. You know, I thought I invented the bud switch. I had a good idea of what was going on in the the Minecraft community at the time, like I watched tons and tons of technical videos back then, and the community was a lot smaller. Well, it turns out there was a video out there with like a hundred views that that showed off the bud switch like two weeks before me. So a lot of people thought I stole the idea from them, <laughs> and it just it just looks bad for me when that happens, right? There's a bunch of arguments on it on on Reddit. I saw it's just like, oh no, why did this have to happen? Uh, so it's just safer not to not to talk about that kind of stuff and just, you know, if you've never seen it before, good. Maybe you'll have a reason to come back to my channel, right? Okay, so the other thing I wanted to mention here is why I show redstone kind of quickly these days. So a lot of people don't have any interest in redstone. That's kind of a given. So, you know, I like to just give a description of what it does because that's something everybody can follow. While I used to go like way into the technical nitty gritty details of like uh, redstone travels 15 blocks and this repeater is actually four game ticks when it's at two ticks and yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't really need to talk about that stuff anymore because I feel a lot of you have gotten way better at the game as well. <laughs> so it's almost like beating a dead horse at this point. You guys know how redstone works for the most part. And especially if you're trying to copy something I made, you probably have a general idea already and can almost just put it together just by looking at it in the video. In fact, that's what I do a lot of times when I need to build something again, like a redstone device. I'll go back to one of my older videos. I try to show it pretty good in the, the episode and usually I can put it together no problem just by looking at it later. And I'm sure a lot of you can do it as well. Like, come on guys. A lot of you put together the Shulker search engine out of like, no angles whatsoever so I, I i think you guys have the ability and i'd rather you guys not just like copy me but actually just try to you know get an idea of what i'm doing and apply it in your own world in your own way so i'm not necessarily trying to give you a one-to-one -one exact tutorial copy of stuff either not that i mind if you do copy me it's perfectly fine if you do i i just think you'll enjoy the game more if you try to like learn and apply stuff in your own way is what i'm trying to say Anyways, thank you for the comment, and I thank you for watching the episode as well. So take care, have a wonderful day, bye-bye.